Anything that you've learned, you've read, you've seen, talked to mom and dad, whatever, you serve. Um, isn't it climate change like different in like the weather or something? Sort of. Weather is a component of climate. So weather is like you wake up in the morning and go, do I need to wear a sweater today or can I wear a t-shirt? Climate is the weather, say, over 30 or 40 years. So yeah, it's related to weather, but it's kind of how the weather changes over time, okay. over a big, long time period. Miss? Is it climate change when, um, so climate is, as you said, it's a component of weather, and then when changes? Do you know what direction it changes? Because change can go in any way. If you think about temperature, what, a scientist, what are scientists telling us about temperature, Miss? Um, that the, it's, the climate is getting warmer. Warmer, that's right. And that has, so all three of you, thank you very much for your answers. Those things that we just learned about climate, what climate is, its definition, and how it affects weather, and the direction it's changing. Because climate change, when you read about it in the newspaper, or you learn about it in science class, or whatever it is you do, what, you hear it on the news, whatever, we're talking about change in one direction, really. The Earth is getting hotter. And those changes aren't uniform over the Earth. There are differences. Like, I'm sure you guys have heard about polar bears and climate change, right? How it's getting warmer up north toward the North Pole, less ice. So polar bears got to swim longer to hunt for seals and walruses and things like that. That's an effect of climate change. That sort of effect up in the North Pole in Alaska is not the same kind of effect that we have here in the Rocky Mountains around Norwood. All right? But the direction is the same. And so we have to deal animals and plants and humans have to figure out a couple things. One, do we even care? Right? When I was your age, I hated being hot. I grew up in Georgia. And, oh. And now I'm older, I'm 43, I hate being cold, right? So I've changed. Like, so maybe I don't care that it's warming up. Maybe I'm like, all right, woo. I don't have to turn the furnace on in the winter time, right? So that's your first question if you're an animal or a plant, and they don't think like we do, but you say, okay, do I even need to worry that it's three or four degrees warmer? And the second is, well, if I say yes, I've got to worry I've got to figure out how to live because if it gets a little hotter, that's no good. What do I do about it? All right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to talk about fish because that's something that I studied in college. I happen to know a lot about, and it's some of the stuff that I do for the Forest Service in this part of the world. But what I want to challenge you to do when we get to the end of what I talk about is think about, is this the same for fish, for all fish? Is this the same for mammals, or birds, or trees? There are some plants that don't grow in hot weather. There are some plants that don't grow in cold weather, right? We can't grow citrus in Norwood, right? No one's got a lemon tree in their backyard. Does anyone have a lemon tree in your backyard? I'm assuming that's a no, right? But uh, my sister-in-law, my wife's sister, has a lemon tree in her backyard. She lives in San Jose, California, right? What's different? The weather, the climate, right? Is that what you say? Thank you. Thanks for raising your hand. Okay, so let's talk about that. So let's talk about cutthroat trout in this part of the world, in western Colorado. And this is a cutthroat trout. I'm sorry that the picture's a little fuzzy, but um, they're pretty awesome. This is the only native trout to Colorado, all right? We have lots of different kinds of trout here, but humans have brought them here and put them in the lakes and the streams and the reservoirs so people can catch them for fun or catch them for food or whatever. The cutthroat trout is the only one that grew up here, was here before humans were here. It's been here for millions of years, all right? Okay, so we talked about climate change. Have you studied any effects? We talked about increasing temperature. We talked about polar bears, how there's less ice for them to hang out on and rest or digest while the, after they eat a seal, right? So we'll talk a little bit about effects. Do we know, what, what do you got, what have you learned about things humans can do to combat climate change? Yes? Right? Right, so 
That's that's so your answer was uh, did anyone hear that? No. She said, no, it's okay. I'll paraphrase for you. So she said, well, if it's super cold, we could build a fire. And if it's super hot, we could wear shorts or sit under an umbrella or turn on the air or something like that. Or, or go into a shelter, right? So that's how we can make a decision to react. Because when it's super cold in the winter, you can't wear that to school, right? And you probably can't go play outside at recess wearing that at school, right? And if you're going to do chores, right? Or things like that, you're going to have to put a jacket on. What I ask about combating climate change, have you learned or studied anything, anything we can do to sort of help uh, fight climate change, to undo climate change? Sir? Um, people say that you should not, like, walk to work and ride rides and stuff because the cars, they're, the gases that they're putting out, it's getting caught in the atmosphere and it's holding heat. That's right. So your answer is something that I do. I live only like seven minutes by bike from where I work, and I ride my bike to work all the time. And that's a decision that my wife and I made to live that close, because I used to have to drive for like 45 minutes to work when we lived in Idaho. So yeah, that's one way you can do it, because cars have dirty motors. So here's the thing I want you to take away about climate change before we start talking about fish. In science, there's no debate. There's no argument, there's no discussion. Climate change is happening. Where people want to fight is whether it's our fault, human beings' fault, or is it just natural? It, does the earth change over time? Sure, right? We see that every year. Spring, summer, fall, winter, that's just a change. And the earth's been around for a bajillion years. I don't know, right? So sure, it changes, but it's happening. There's no debate about that. We have to decide as human beings, as an animal species that lives on this planet, can we do anything about it? Do we care? Do we want to do? And that's one thing each and every one of us could do, right? Is we could walk to work and not start our car and spit out stinky stuff. We could recycle. Because like an aluminum pop can, I don't see anybody, oh, yep. Like an aluminum can, let's say making this can from a raw aluminum takes 100 energy units, all right? If you take this can and make another can with it, it only takes two energy units. 2% of the energy to recycle aluminum compared to using making new aluminum. Those are all just smart, simple things we can do. Yes, in the back. Uh, because I don't remember what city it was, but they were trying to Why would that help? Because it was really hot and dry and dirty. Do you know how they try to make it rain? Do you know what they do? They like launch water. Yeah, they call it cloud seeding, right? What do you, yeah, what do you want to like, add to that? They like made like clouds with like dynamite sticks or something like that. Like, yeah. It's not dynamite yeah, like sticks, but like. use like these kind of, some like, sort of like, kind of like fireworks. And when they light them, smoke comes out and it makes the clouds kind of like. And then it gets water. Right. Water, and then it'll start raining. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, that's it. So we're, I don't want to get stuck here for too long, because I want to transition to talking about fish and climate change. So part of my job with the Forest Service is to deal with, OK, climate's changing, and cutthroat trout aren't as common as they used to be. They used to be everywhere, and now they're only in a few places. And climate change could potentially cause the places that they live to no longer be hospitable. Imagine, like, close your eyes real quick and go, okay, I see my house where I live. All right, good. Now, rip the roof off. Can you still live there? No, no. You, well, sure you could. Would no. it be awesome? No. 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 Right? So that's the kind of change to the habitat. The water will still be there, but will it be too hot? Yeah. Like, will there not be enough of it? That it sort of thing. So All right? Okay, so cutthroat trout. Here's another picture. You can see, I just think they're so pretty like the orange and the red on the belly, and then all the big black spots by the tail. That's the head. They're called cutthroat trout because under their gills, right here, they have a big red slash of pigment. So it looks like someone came by and cut, cut the their throat. throat, right? That's what it looked like in the first picture. It looked yeah. like they were bleeding. 
Right. So they weren't though. This one went back and lived to swim around and fight another day. All right. So they used to be everywhere in the Colorado River, Dolores River, that sort of stuff. We generally think that before Lewis and Clark brought people west, right, when it was just the aboriginal, the native peoples of this part of the world, Cutthroat trout were everywhere in the Colorado, everywhere in the Dolores, everywhere in the San Miguel. They moved around a lot, but they were kind of everywhere. Now they're only really found in higher elevation. You know what I mean by that? Nod your head if you know what I mean by higher elevation, like up in the mountains, right? And in small populations, small streams. And what I mean by small populations or small streams is a population of cutthroat trout might only occupy one mile of stream. All right? Okay, so question is what we see now on the landscape in Colorado, where cutthroat trout are located, where they're confined to, these small high streams. Is that because of climate change? Mm, yeah. Good, good. So a lot of yeah, people said no, cool. and a bunch of people said mmm, because you didn't know. The answer's no. The answer's no. Right? There's other factors that have caused cutthroat trout to be restricted up into the mountains. All right? So that's a funky phrase, thermal ecology. All right, and I've abbreviated cutthroat trout as CRCT for Colorado River Cutthroat Trout. That's their full official name, like mine is Matthew Robert Dare. That's their official name, Colorado River Cutthroat Trout. Okay, so what do I mean by thermal? What is thermal, therm, what does that mean? Yes? It's the temperature. Temperature, having to do with heat, right? Yeah. Thermal has to do with heat. And Ms. Cole had already asked you about ecology. So quickly, someone raise your hand and tell me what ecology means. Not you, overachiever. You, miss. It's the uh, study of how living things interact with each other on the You just read that out of a book somewhere, <laughs> right? Did everyone hear that? Yeah. The study of how living things interact with their abiotic or non-living environment, right? Yeah. How those two things interact to make an ecosystem, OK? All right, so let's talk about this real quick. There's a lot of words on the slide. I apologize for that. So. For a cold-blooded organism like a fish, or a lizard, or an insect, or anything like that, even a plant, they're technically cold-blooded because they don't really make their own heat, right? Water temperature is the most important environmental factor. By far, nothing's close. All right? So I think you have a section in there for ecology. You might make it up, cold-blooded, temperature, right? It's nothing's even close. So think about if climate is changing and the earth is warming and water's getting hotter, that's temperature, that's gonna affect cutthroat trout, maybe. All right? Okay, so for cutthroat trout, the optimal summer temperature is between 12 and 18 degrees Celsius. And that is, I actually converted it for you because not everyone likes Celsius like I do. All right, that's like 54 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so is that hot? No. no. What's your bathtub water temperature? Do you guys have an idea? Celsius, like, probably 70. It's over 100. That's right. In 70 degree water, actually, you could get hypothermia pretty quickly. Oh. That's actually pretty cold. That's like the pool. Oh. If, if you have a pool at the rec center, an indoor pool, those are sometimes like 85 degrees. Oh. Right, so that's actually not that hot. Like bath water is like 105. Mm. That's comfortable bath water. Okay, so you've got half that. So it's pretty cold, right? That's not hot water. So up high in the mountains, water's cold, okay? So when the temperatures are too cold or too hot, so outside that window, outside that range, they don't eat as much, they don't grow as much, they don't move as much, and they don't make as many babies. That's what I mean by reproductive success. So you guys following that? Yeah. So imagine, like, think about like a snake in a in an aquarium, in a terrarium. If it's really cold, are they moving around all the time? No, 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 no. They're, no. You're, they're waiting till that heat rock, right? right? Or if you've ever seen a lizard sitting on a rock in the morning, or a dragonfly sitting in the morning on a limb or a branch with their wings out like this, they're waiting for the sun to warm them up so they can fly. Okay? Temperature is so important. It's not just their ability to move, but it's their ability to digest food. It's their ability to go get food. Cutthroat trout chase down their food. All the fish, but mostly insects, right? Oh, yeah. If they gotta move away from a predator, or move away from a disturbance, or move away from hot water, and they can't do it 
that's a bad deal for them, all right? So when you get up above about 83 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 26, so that's like pool water, indoor pool water, they die. It just kills them. It's a good question. Why? Too hot. Anyone ever, well, of course it's too hot, but that's, your answer is circular. They die because it's too hot. Why? Because it's too hot. So who's heard the word enzyme? Anyone heard that word? Does anyone know what it is? Okay. Every living thing has these little molecules inside their cells, inside their bodies called enzymes. And what enzymes do is they play a really important part in all the chemical reactions that we do in our body. So if you ate breakfast and you're now digesting breakfast and your breakfast is in your small intestine and you're trying to pull out the protein and pull out the good fat and pull out the energy from that, enzymes play a role in that chemical reaction because that's all it is, it's a chemical reaction. Getting breakfast, I had granola, right? Turning my granola into meat. Enzymes help do that. Living things enzymes only work in a narrow band of temperature and other conditions. Above 83 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 C, those enzymes, which are proteins, they just break apart. No enzymes. All right? That's why temperature is so important, because those enzymes work best between 12 and 18 degrees Celsius. Below 12, they don't work very well. Up above 18, they don't work very well. And above 26, those enzymes, the molecules, they just go like this. And if that happens, you die. All right? So that's what I mean by the thermal ecology. That's why temperature is so important. OK, so these are two streams on the north end of the Uncompahgre Plateau. That way, right? OK, so on the y-axis, the vertical axis, that's temperature. I've got those two lines here, this one for 12, this one for 18. This is just date, all right? The hottest time of the year in this part of the world is July, basically. Hottest month of the year, hottest 30 days is right around July. So you probably can't see it, but we have July 9th through the end of August. And you can see the lines, the red one is for a pretty hot stream, Big Dominguez Creek. The blue line is for a colder stream, La Faire Creek. See how those lines go up? as we move through July, and then once we get into August, they come back down, yeah. right? Okay, so inside the band, that's the sweet spot for cutthroat trout. Making babies, growing, moving, having fun, etc. How do those look to you? Tell me something that you notice about the red line. Miss? Is that it's like higher than the blue line, so that means it's hotter? Correct. Yeah, there's little variations from day to day to day. This is from temperature sensors that were taking temperatures every half hour. Sir, what do you see? Good. Do you see anything about the red line which suggests that the water in Big Dominguez Creek might be too hot for cut the chop? What do you see, oh. sir? Like, yeah, like how that line in uh, 29. Right. That line, like the, like the highest point of the red line is. It pops up. Yeah, Good. It's bad. Good. And then what about this blue line, La Fair Creek? Oh, it's is too it in cold. any danger of being too hot anytime soon? Yes no. or no? No. Shout it out. Good. What about, so this is 12, this is 18. For the hottest month of the year, it's comfortably in that window, right? Yeah. That's good. Okay, now think about climate change. Imagine we just take both of these lines and move them up two degrees. A lot of fish would die. Maybe. Remember, these numbers reflect how fast they grow, how well they feed, how many babies they make, right? Okay, so take these and just move them up two degrees. The red line, can you envision that being well above that top black line? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. That's climate change. That's what would happen if the temperature went up two degrees Celsius, which is about four degrees Fahrenheit. And scientists think that could happen over the next 30 or 40 years. But, but, the blue line, jack that up two degrees. It's fine. It's fine. That's right. That's right. 
So the uh, potential effect of climate change on cutthroat trout is not the same everywhere. These two streams are actually in exactly the same watershed. The blue stream flows into the red stream. And the temperature is completely different. The pattern's the same, but the temperature is completely different. So the blue, the blue line, when it goes into the red line, when it cools the river down? It does, but not so much, because the red line is a bigger stream. So imagine you have a big bucket of hot water, and you pour this bit of cold water into it. It's not going to cool it off so much, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what's happening there. OK, so this is the same information, but our thick black line is 26. That's the depth line, right? Yeah. So this is that stream, Big Dominguez Creek, and this is LaFerre Creek. Same question, Big Dominguez Creek. Imagine those temperatures go up 2 degrees Celsius over the next 35, 40 years. Oh. So the time that you guys are you know, 50 years old. What do you think? Green. It would be, the red would be one degree above the limit. Yeah, the red would at least be consistently above, above the 26 line. Yeah. So would this stream, the red stream, be good cutthroat trout no, habitat? No. no, not at all. They Terrible. Go there. That's right. And if they were there now, if we had a population there now, would they be able to survive? No. no. Probably not. Probably not. Right? But what about the blue stream? They're fine. Yeah. They're fine. Now think about the implication. These streams are in the same watershed. Big Dominguez Creek flows like this, and the Fair Creek comes in like this. Now if you have cutthroat trout all over the watershed, you'd lose them in Big Dominguez Creek probably. We agree? Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Right? But would we lose them in the Fair? No. Nope. All over the Rocky Mountains, that's what water temperature looks like. Some places, you look at it, and you look at the data, and you go, holy Toledo, climate change would destroy this whole thing. In other places, you look at the data, and you go, not that bad, actually. Right? Not a death sentence for cutthroat trout. All right? OK, so we've answered this question largely. If the water in streams warms up a few degrees, is that bad for native trout in western Colorado? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. The answer, actually, is by and large, no. No. The vast majority of streams on, in the mountains all around us are actually on the cold side. The vast majority of streams, oh boy, see I'm all old and I need glasses to see What are you looking for, Matt? That. <laughs> you put that there. All right? The vast majority of streams look like this, or even colder. So they're kind of too cold. For cutthroat trout, right now, will make it more but climate change might improve that situation for cutthroat trout, right? So the answer is, if we, if you say, if you're thinking, all right, cutthroat trout, oh, woe is me, they're going to be gone because of climate change. That's just not true. The best available science says actually they may do a little better. All right, okay, but that doesn't mean it's not a big deal because it is, because there's a catch related to the ecology or related to the physical environment. So this is a watershed. I drew it with my sophisticated art skills, right? And these are fish, OK? So what I want you to think about, because we're going to look at this picture several times, big, thick blue lines is a big river, OK? Like the San Miguel or the Dolores. The little lines are little streams that are tributary to it. And the relative size of the fish in the pictures indicate the relative size of the population and the relative size of the animals that make up that population. So fish in little streams are little. Fish in big rivers are big. Fish in the ocean are monstrous. Right? OK? All right? Fun fact about fish. Theoretically, they could grow to massive, like monster, like fight Godzilla size. But Mother Nature holds that down. Right? OK, so now check this out. Woo, mind-blowing bit of climate change just happened. All right? This stream went from blue to red. Red means it's no longer suitable. It's too hot. Fish trial. Were they down there? No. No. So if this water warms up or even goes away completely, does it matter? No. No. Not for that population, because look at all. They're, they're in the same habitat. Right? They're in the same habitat. This will be a little different. 
So this part of the small stream has now changed red. And this is, what did he do? Or she? Yeah. Moved up out of the way. Fish are exceptionally mobile animals. They'll just get out of the way. OK? They can get out of the way. So is this a big deal? Yeah. Well, kind of. Does anyone see this? Oh. Do you see how we got too hot up past this tributary junction? Yeah. What does that mean for that population? That one's not good. It can't get out, or things can't get to it. So in conservation biology, we call that isolated or fragmented. All right? Okay. Now your population, which used to be connected, because they could swim up, down, left, right, back, and forth, is now fragmented. It's chopped up. And now this population is all by itself. So imagine, for fun, we just drop a big bomb on this population. I mean, it's a silly example. It's a stupid example. But imagine, just for fun, we drop a big bomb on this population. And then right? they all die, and then we have one more population, well, two more. Can any of these populations get back to it? No. No. And you're right. Now you had, you had three populations that talked to each other and went out on dates and made babies together. And now you only have two. Right? And they're in a much smaller area. Well, still free because that means that population We've just dropped a bomb on it, remember? Oh, yeah. For fun. We just dropped a bomb. Right? Okay, so the water's warming. Scientists aren't fighting about that. All right? We're not debating on that. The water is warming. Okay? So what can we do to help them out? What can we do? You know, what? let's just assume, yeah, we need to do something. Or ice and hot water. Well, that's a good idea, and people have thought about that. But, so her little answer was, we could put ice in the water. Where do you get the ice? From water. From water. It's really cold mountains. And the mountains don't need that ice. Oh, like and how do you get the ice from the really cold mountains to the water? Me. And if you're driving it in a truck or in an airplane, what does that fly with? Gas. Gas, gas. which makes pollution. So. If you just do an accounting of some ideas, because that's a great idea and people have thought about it. But it's got, there's a flip side. There's a flip side to it. Sir, what's your comment? But when if, like, it wasn't, okay. if there was a possibility that you could do that, if the from the mountain, wouldn't it take a lot to make the water cold again? It depends on the size of the stream. So his and comment was, wouldn't it take a lot? Yeah. And like the river, the dark, remember when you said that the thing, so long and so much ice it's basically impossible yeah. yeah good point so let's talk about this so if you ever you might want to write this down like there's a discipline in biology called conservation biology discipline is just means one branch one part and conservation biology has basically two jobs two rules two laws two commandments, however you want to see it in your mind. When doing conservation biology, you can do two things. You can, and I've got these flipped, and it really makes me mad. Um, you could protect the populations we have, so you protect what you got. Okay? So think of, it, think of your favorite animal if you have one. Mine's a cheetah. I just think they're super awesome, uh -huh. right? Tiger's number two, because they're even more super awesome, OK? And if we want to do conservation biology on cheetahs or tigers, our number one job is not to kill more cheetahs and tigers, dog, right? OK? Take care of the places they live, that sort of thing. But if we get, if we're doing that, we can do this other thing. We can make more of them, right? Maybe we have cheetahs make babies in zoos, and then take those babies out to the wild and introduce them into the wild. My scientific hero, Jane Goodall, has been doing that for 50 years with chimpanzees, right? There's lots of different ways we could do that. But what I want you to remember is conservation biology only has two things you do. Protect what you have, make more of it. Yes? You bring up a very good point, which is if you have a baby that's been in captivity, can you teach it to be wild? 
Sometimes yes, sometimes no. A lot of energy is expended in figuring out how to make that baby think it's wild from the day it's born, right? And there are ways to do that. And like chimps that have been taken out of the wild for one reason or another, they can actually be put back. You've got to be very patient, and it might not be the full wild, but you don't have to keep them in a cage for the rest of their life. But you bring up a good point. And for those of you that are thinking like this, like devil's advocates trying to poke holes in this, great. Because there are perfect answers. All I want to relay to you is, if we're talking about cutthroat trout, our number one job is to make sure we don't screw up cutthroat trout habitat that we know is out there. And our second job is, is if we can make more cutthroat trout, awesome. All right, sir? Well, what I mean is, in that case, so let's go through these bullet points and I'll see if I can answer your question, right? So I'm not implying make a zoo, but that's a good point to discuss. If we're making more populations, we might put fish, cut the trout, in waters that they haven't lived in before. Has anyone heard of Woods Lake over by Telluride, mm -hmm. right? Woods Lake is a place that Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Forest Service used to have brook trout. Brook trout are not native to Colorado, okay? Uh, we took all the brook trout out of that entire watershed, all right? And then we put cutthroat trout in it. That's what I mean by uninhabited waters. Remove non-natives. The number one threat to cutthroat trout all across the range, which is the entire western United States and basically western North America, is non-native species. Brook trout, rainbow trout, brown trout in particular. Nothing's even close, in my professional opinion, as a threat to the long-term survival of native cutthroat trout. So we can just get rid of them. I have streams on the forest that I go to every year and take brook trout out to try to make sure they don't get in to take cutthroat trout. How do you take them out and prevent them from dying? Well, I, I don't prevent them from dying. I know, I know, but like, how would you like take all the Use electricity. Yes, you can use electricity. That's a topic for another time. We won't have time to talk about climate change if we talk about that. Let's just assume I have an awesome power where I can selectively take out non-native fishes from a, no, fishes is grammatically correct when you talk about more than one species. It's fishes, all right? Let's ha assume I have the ability to take that out, to take brook trout out of a stream when I want to and where I want to. Okay? You can do that. Hold your questions, hold your comments, particularly if they're about taking fish out. What is your question? So, like, and I'll give you your chance. What you mean is, like, if there's, like, a bug that's from, like, Asia or something and it comes here and it's taking over bugs from over here, would that be what you're talking about? Very similar to that, very similar to that. There's two kinds of doves that live around here. There's the morning dove, which is native to Colorado, and then there's the Eurasian collared dove. It's bigger, and it basically has the same ecology, but it's bigger, and it's more prolific, which means it makes more babies. And that's kind of how an invasive species works. It just shows up, it says, now I'm an invasive species, right? And I come here, and you and I, sis, have basically the same ecology. We live the same places, we um, eat the same things, and um, let's see, we live the same places and eat the same things. But look at me, I'm huge, right? So all I gotta do, if she wants my feeding rock, I just keep going like this, right? Like in soccer, when you're waiting for the play to come to you, you just sort of keep bumping, right? Now, eventually, she's gonna get angry and do what? Go away. Or, I'm going to be doing this so much that she can't eat, and what's going to happen? She's going to die. She's going to die, right? That's how it works, right? Sorry. All right? See, but now she'll never forget how invasive species work. In the back. Um, is that why when people have them, like when they fly over them, a lot of hat bring any plants? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why there's rules on what kind of plants and animals you can bring into the country or bring into the state. Right? Very quickly, and then I want to move on. What's the significance of cutthroat trout? Why do you care about them more than 
because they're from here. But they're not the same fish. And they're not from you. Murder them. Murder what? They're like they're popular. Yeah, it's kind of like racist. No, it's not racist at all. It's not racist at all. And you bring up a good philosophical point. But I can dodge that argument very quickly. There is a law in our country called the Endangered Species Act. And it says that when the government, like the Forest Service, identifies that a particular species is in imminent danger of becoming extinct or getting really close to the edge. We, by law, the government, is required to do everything possible to keep them from going extinct. You follow? Okay, wait, hold it. In the case of cutthroat trout, cutthroat trout were on the path to being listed under the Endangered Species Act. What the government of the state of Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Wyoming, the places where this animal lives, got together and said, well, we don't want that, so we have a plan to keep them from becoming endangered. So we're not making a value judgment on one is better than the other, but what we're saying is we don't want cutthroat trout to go extinct in the same way that I don't want pandas to go extinct, or tigers, or blue whales, or other cool animals, or other cool places, right? I mean, does anyone really want things to go extinct? No. And as it turns out, the animals that are causing so much trouble for cutthroat trout in Colorado, they're getting their butts kicked where they are native. Okay? So you bring up a good question. The other answer to your question is, and it's important, so you don't think we're just making, like we're making a God judgment, like we're in charge and this one lives and this one dies. It's not like that. What, is, what would be unique and interesting about the fish of Colorado if we only had, if we didn't have any cutthroat trout? We would still have trout. What would be unique about Colorado if we didn't have cutthroat trout? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Recreational fishing in the state of Colorado brings in approximately two and a half billion dollars a year. If I can spend my money in any other state in the union and catch all the same crap that I can catch in Colorado, why would I come here? So there's an economic argument, there's a conservation argument, right? So it's a good point. I need to move on so we don't run out of time. How much time do I have, Catherine? Um, about seven minutes. I need to move on. Okay. So let's talk about cutthroat trout. We said high mountains. Does anyone see the stream in this picture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what it looks like. Little, that's me in the Kiowa hat. That's a stream. I'm like 5'8", right? So not a big stream. These are the places where cutthroat trout live now. Okay? So we'll probably end up ending here because you're going to get the punchline of our story. But this is an important place to stay. Do you remember when we talked about stream temperature and we concluded that it wasn't really a big deal. Like the earth warmed up in Col around Colorado a couple degrees. Do you remember that we didn't say it was too big of a deal for cutthroat trout? It might even be a good thing. You guys remember that? Yeah. Okay, so we have that, so temperature is not a big deal. But we know that cutthroat trout are stuck up in the high mountains in small streams. And they can't go upstream forever, right? Eventually they get to the top. You follow? Yeah. So they're stuck up there. Well, is that, are those places like happy, gentle, calm places, no. the tops of mountains? What happens up there? Avalanche. Yell it out, just yell it out. Oh, Avalanches, yeah. storms, snow, no. ice, hail, hail, hail fires, rocks. landslides, debris flows, mass wastage, all of that stuff. The mountains are an incredibly dynamic environment. Okay? So these are the things that happen up there. Super cold winters. Rain on top of snow in the springtime causes landslides and floods. Lightning and fire. Big fires happen. Fires aren't really a big deal for fish in the mountains. But what happens after them if you get a thunderstorm, a big landslide is, right? Thunderstorms, drought. Drought, low snow year. Maybe the streams dry up or there's so little water they heat up. Okay? So 
climate change and disturbances in the summer, more fires, more thunderstorms, hotter air. In the winter, less snow, more wet water, more rain. Those are things that could affect the habitat that the fish are in now. And sure, the water won't be too warm for them. Maybe it'll even be better. Maybe it'll be like going from the cold pool to the hot tub. Oh, so awesome. Love the hot tub, right? Yeah. Hot tub's where I do my best work. But maybe the hot tub is at greater risk of blowing up. I don't know. And that's the kind of double-edged sword of where cutthroat trout are at now. If the climate warms up and the earth gets a little warmer around here and the water gets a little warmer, so what? That's not the big deal. But when you warm up a couple degrees, you end up with less snow, more rain, more thunderstorms, more fires, more disturbance. And it's that stuff that affects cutthroat trout. So let's look at a map again. Little streams to big rivers. And I apologize for not taking your questions, but I want to show you this graphic. Same watershed before, right? Big river, little streams. Okay, up top in the mountains, they're good for spawning. They're good for making babies. Okay? Yeah. That's where they go to make babies, right? Yeah. All right? Down below, the environment's stable. Okay? Less disturbance, lots of food, so they can get bigger. So this is how Mother Nature works. And if you think of salmon, this is exactly how salmon work. You have populations all over the watershed up top, right? Yeah. Now some of them go down in the fall, and they live in the big rivers. And notice I've got this one, this one, and that one going, that one staying. Because I made it up, right? OK, here's what happens. Those three populations go down. And those migratory individuals, they have more food, slightly warmer water, so they grow more and they get huge. All right? Okay? And then in the springtime, they just swim right back upstream and spawn and make babies. So for this population that didn't migrate, they stay small, they don't have to move, but they stay small. Moving is very costly. Hold your question, please. Moving is very costly. The benefit is, if you move, you get huge. And in fish, the bigger the lady is, the more baby she makes. Right? Yeah. And that's a tremendous benefit to moving. OK? So that cycle just repeats. That's the salmon cycle. Swim upstream, make babies. Babies swim out to the ocean, get huge two, three, four, five years, come back. OK? What do they do in those tiny rivers when they're huge? They make babies. So they come back into the river specifically to fall in love and have a family. Ooh. All right? Yeah. So, and that cycle repeats year after year after year. OK? So what if a fire wipes out that part of the watershed and destroys that part of the habitat temporarily, not permanently? Is it a big deal? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. Thank you for seeing the future. No, not really. You know why? Because Mother Nature has this insurance policy downstream. That's what it is. This is all the same species, right? They're all cutthroat trout. But Mother Nature has spread the risk around. Listen up. If you don't care anything about biology, I'm teaching you about economics and accounting. All right? Mother Nature spread that species around over the landscape so that one disturbance, no matter how big, cannot wipe the species out. Can't. There is no fire big enough. There is no landslide big enough if you have a big watershed. And when I was in Idaho and I worked with an animal called bull trout, we had these giant fires. Hold your question. We had these giant fires that happened in July. And then in August, there were thunderstorms. And the thunderstorms wiped out these streams where we knew bull trout swam upstream to make babies. And we were walking the stream in September. Bull trout spawn in the fall. And we were walking the stream in September or early October, looking at the stream that had been destroyed and thinking, oh, well, there goes this population of bull trout. And you know what we saw in the stream? Two big, fat bull trout 
swimming upstream looking for a place to make babies. That's the insurance policy. That habitat's not wiped out. It's just been abandoned for a few years. So the question is, can they do that now? Yeah. No. They can't. They can't. Why not, do you think? Because the, um, the warm water cut off their way to get back in the The water's too warm? Why is the water too warm? Uh, because of climate. Not because of climate. What do we, whose parents are in agriculture? What? Agriculture. Whose parents are farmers or ranchers? Anyone? Ants, uncles, anything? What's in the way? Diversions. Right? Non-native fish. Right? Too hot water downstream. So the answer to the question is, is climate change a big deal for fish? It's actually, or for cutthroat tribes, it's actually, yeah. But it's not really directly because of climate change. It's for all these other things that we have to think about, not just the earth getting hotter. Now, I didn't leave a lot of time for questions. Ms. Colbert has my email and my phone number. If anyone wants to send me an email or call me or anything like that because you're dying to know more, I will happily answer your question. It will make my work day, I promise. All right? Yep. And as you move to lunch, because I think it's lunch now, it if you need to ask me any questions on the way to lunch, here I am. Thanks for your time. Thank you.